Hey, everybody, this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey is brought to you by our title sponsor, NHL Sense Arena. Look, we all want our kids to succeed in hockey, but let's face it, finding training that's both effective and enjoyable can be a real challenge, and not to mention expensive and a total drain on time, especially if you have to drive to the rink, uh, pay a, a private instructor. There's so many reasons that uh, money gets spent on this game. But that's where NHL Sense Arena steps in. It's a virtual reality training game that brings the rink into your home that takes off-ice training to a new reality. It's designed to improve hockey sense and IQ, something that's lacking majorly in the game today for both players and goalies. And you get unlimited access to over 100 drills and training plans from top coaches and players that can be played anytime, anywhere with drills approved by USA Hockey player and goalie development directors. Look, improving mental hockey skills at home has really never been more fun and any hockey player that uses this is going to have a blast, all right? I've used this before on my own, and it feels like you're so immersed in an arena, you sometimes forget you have a headset on. And again, it's not being on the ice, but it allows you to work on some of these skill sets like scanning, as I said before, hockey IQ, looking around the rink, making the right plays, that getting those repetitions in now as a hockey player are super important for your development. So NHL Sense Arena is giving all the listeners an exclusive offer for $50 off an annual plan when you use our code Hockey Never Stops at checkout. Again, that's Hockey Never Stops. All you got to do is go to hockey.sensearena.com. Uh, Again, that's hockey.sensearena.com. Use the code Hockey Never Stops, and you'll save $50 on your an annual plan of NHL Sense Arena. Make sure to check that out and enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. <laughs> Our guest today has been with an organization since day one in the NHL, and they have seen a lot of hockey. So you're really going to enjoy this. I'm not going to lie to you. It's a little flyer centric, but I promise you all listening, no matter what NHL team you root for, you're going to enjoy this episode because we really dive in with the questioning on what makes NHL athletes great. What, what makes games so great? What makes mites on ice so great? So you're going to enjoy this one, I promise, no matter where you are. And if, if, you, if you don't, email me. At Lee, I'm sorry, team at ourkidsplayhockey.com. Uh, also, want to remind you if you want to support us and support the show, make sure you check out our partners, Hockey Wraparound. Uh, they have the top selling off ice hockey training aid in the Hockey Wraparound. They also have a patented, beautiful, uh, portable dryer for your equipment that attaches right to the stick called the Dry Stick. Uh, they are uh, good friends of ours for uh, some of you might know obvious reasons, but uh, we really believe in that product and they are a trust first fan first led business so if you head over to hockeywraparound.com use okph at checkout you're going to get a discount uh, on their number one selling hockey wraparound blade protector there is nothing else out there that compares to it uh, make sure you check that out again hockeywraparound.com okph at checkout but without further ado let's get you to the episode with our guest today lou nolan who has been with his organization since day one here we go Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. I'm Lee Elias with Mike Benelli. Our guest today has witnessed eight Stanley Cup finals, two NHL All-Star games, multiple outdoor games, the NCAA Frozen Four, the NHL Entry Draft, and has been around the NHL players, executives, coaches, and fans since 1967. He is the author of If These Walls Could Talk, which I have my signed copy right here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Philadelphia Flyers public address announcer, Lou Nolan to the show. Lou, welcome to Our Kids Play Hockey. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm glad to be here, and this should be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie to you, man. It's a little surreal that that voice is speaking to me because it's a voice that I've been hearing uh, my entire life as a Flyers fan. Uh, I want to assure the entire audience as well. We have a lot of Flyers fans that listen, but I promise the non-Flyers fans you're going to enjoy this episode because as we do, we're going to dive into the game a lot and, and lose really amazing experience. And Lou, again, you've literally been with the Flyers since year one. Um, there are not many people in the NHL who can say that with a franchise as tenured as the Philadelphia Flyers, which allows me to ask a really unique question. Over the lifespan of the team, the highs and the lows, in your opinion, what are the key factors to a franchise succeeding but also floundering? <laughs> Hockey <laughs> players, management, uh, luck, the draft, um, free agency. Uh, things of that nature. You know, the, the team that started here was uh, uh, a bunch of guys that were 
you know, I'd love to see the average age of the team that we started with in 67. I don't know, but it's, I remember the guys I was around them. I did some traveling then and a uh, good bunch of people, but they were not kids. Uh, they were cast offs uh, that were uh, sort of allowed to be drafted by their own teams. And the NHL draft then was just to submit your players who can be drafted and you go ahead and do them. Uh, as opposed to now, uh, you pay so much for a franchise that uh, uh, Gary Bettman has ensured them that they'll be competitive. And, uh, you know, you look at Vegas. I mean, you know, you, they pull a great draft. Their, their GM makes a few deals where I won't draft your guy if, uh, you know, <laughs> if you give me this guy and uh, make some deals there, get some players and do some smart things and you're in the finals. You know, it's uh, it's an amazing, amazing sport. But uh, from from a team that was fairly uh, uh, mature, that's a good word, yeah. uh, to a team now, which we have, which is fairly young, except for one or two people that changed the average a little bit. But uh, this is a bunch of kids now. And uh, I've seen it from uh, guys that, that I was uh, younger than uh, to a team that won the cup that I was their, their age, uh, the same. So hanging out was different to a team now where, you know, they're all kids, uh, except for a few guys and they're even younger than me. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's different. You know, Lou, I, I had the privilege of working at the NHL, uh, during the time when the 40th anniversary was going on and they did that documentary. And I remember on the cutting room floor, I won't say, but just, just to give the listeners an idea how much things have changed. Uh, Hall of Fame player back in the 70s and, and, and early 80s was saying that, uh, you know, they started doing off ice training quotations here. And there's this <laughs> great shot of him with a cigarette training in, in, in the training room, smoking between reps. Uh, so you could say a lot has changed uh, in terms of the athletes and the demeanor of athletes uh, over that time period. But I, I never forgot that video. It was crazy. It's so true. You know, uh, um, people arrived at training camp and, um, they were to get in shape, you yeah, know, they right, arrived to right. camp to get in shape. Now if they arrive in camp to get in shape, guess what? They're cut. Yeah. They've got to stay all year and they've got to stay in condition because somebody's going to take your job. Yeah. You know, you know, that's, you know, those are, you know, I mean, your, your lifespan of the game, right. Is really, um, you know, one of the reasons we love having guys like you on is because we get to hear uh, really, you know, just the evolution of the player. But one of the things that's always a common theme with us and, and, and anybody we talk to from NHL perspective with the players is the quality of the athlete, mm -hmm. like just the, 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 what the person does. And and I was just wondering, you know, from your perspective, um, you know, what are you, what do you think some of the qualities of these players you've seen over all these years um, spanning in the NHL, you know, what are the similar qual qualities that you see in these players that are succeeding and the young, the old, you know, the veterans, the new guys, I mean, obviously off ice training is one thing and not, you know, having a, you know, a, a, you know, take, taking a, taking a cigarette before uh, the second period has probably changed, <laughs> but, but, oh, but, yeah. you know, but just, you know, just what are the, you know, some of the qualities you see in the young men that, that you're dealing with, cause you have to interview these guys, you have to get to know them. You're, you're getting their backstories. I mean, what's some of the qualities that, you know, some of our players that want to list that are going to be listening to this uh, might take away from, you know, your experiences with the, with the players you work with. Uh, well, uh, I'll tell you, Mike, uh, don't be afraid to work would be number one <laughs> and work all the time. Uh, skate hard, uh, listen to your coach. Um, you know, be ready to go, be able to shoot the puck, uh, work on your skating, work on your shooting. Remember that the puck is at the end of your stick. So it's a little different perspective. Gordy Howe used to say, when I saw the net, uh, same thing with, with Gretzky, I would know that the, it was about two feet, three feet away from me as far as the angles go. So, you know, understand that, understand that and uh, uh, be a team player. And the game's not about you. The game's about your team winning. I love yeah, that. you probably see that all the time, right? When you talk to your when you talk to these guys, you, you're they, they, you know I think hockey is a unique uh, a unique group of individuals where you you don't really hear maybe it's creeping in a little bit, but you you don't really hear the the me and I did this and and you know I accomplished this. I mean that that you know can you talk about you know when you're when you're speaking with these uh, these players that are coming in? I mean that's uh, you know that's unique I think in the sport of hockey. Do, do you agree or? I do, I do, Mike, and I think that they have to think that way. Uh, there, there are some now that think the game is about them. And there have been some guys down through the years that have thought that, uh, that, uh, once they've been around a couple of years, realize that it's not, 
uh, because of uh, maybe they sit for a couple of periods or do something like that and don't get in the game. But, um, you know, uh, it's uh, uh, you got to have the right mental attitude. You know, you got to be ready to work and to to be able to, you know, you don't shoot for the goal if you got a shot for another guy there, if you got a better angle or something of that nature. But you still guys still see guys like, like young guys. If you watch the first couple of games, they might pass up a shot, which they should take uh, to make a pass. Uh, so um, you got to do both. But you, you're scoring goals is the name of the game. Just giving the puck to somebody with an opportunity. Right. Lou, you're bringing up some good points. I'm taking notes here. And one of the things that you remind me of, the first thing you said is don't be afraid to work, right? And uh, one of the cool things about, you know, where you're at in the position of the game is, you know, and, and me too, and Mike also, we get to watch a lot of NHL warmups when we want to. And one of the things I noticed when watching NHL warmups is these guys are always, even in the warmup, shooting to score. You know, and Mike and I know this, you go to a youth game, in the warmups, you hear two things. You hear pucks off goalies' helmets, and the backboard's getting hit by the puck, right? You go to an NHL warm-up, every puck is in the net or, or off the post, right? And when they miss the net, they they give a little grimace, like, ah, you know, I missed. So one of the things, especially to our listening audience, and especially to youth hockey warm-ups, remind your children, A, always be shooting to score, whether it's a practice, a game, a warm-up, right? And then shoot with an intention, right? If you're warming up the goalie, warm up the goalie <laughs> you know what i mean don't just shoot at the goalie's head and do 16 moves uh it's like it's like a common problem i see in youth hockey that i think more coaches should be teaching but the the other thing lou is just uh, the 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 eye of the nhl athlete of i'm putting the puck in the net i always found that to be astounding have you have you seen that have you experienced that as well well uh, as i said earlier you know the name of the game is the score right uh it's it's not to uh uh, impress somebody with your prowess in the warm-up. You have to be prepared for everything. Uh, if they're putting in the work in the weight room, uh, you know, you head on the ice, and you might ride a bicycle for a while there, do these things at the pro level, just to get the muscles ready. Right. And then when you're out there, you know, you, you start out with uh, uh, preparing the goalie. And that's the first part of the warm-up is preparing the goalie. Uh, you know, he'll come in the net, take a few shots, take a skate. The other guy will come in, he takes a skate. And then the guy that's going to play is in there uh, for maybe, you know, five, eight minutes. But at that point, it changes. The second time it changes where you start getting your line rushes and people do that. Uh, instead of just, you know, single pucks here and there and everything else. But uh, you have to have the eye. You have to be ready. And, um, you know, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it has to be, uh, you know. You have to be prepared. You have to shoot with a reason, with something in your brain that says, I'm shooting here for this reason. Right. I've been told the goalie has a has a slow glove, which they, none of them have anymore. These guys are all really good. Right. Uh, or, you know, uh, uh, the stick side, there's going to be a hole. You know, when you go up with the stick, there's going to be a hole somewhere. So if you can hit the hole or hit the pipe, <laughs> like you say, uh, it, it works out okay, you know. Yeah, it, it is amazing how players evolve and that evolves goaltenders and then goalies evolve and that involves players. And, and that's one of the beautiful parts of the game. And as you said, we're reaching a point now where they're they're both so good that sometimes I wonder if people understand the skill level. Um, a, another thing you said was, you know, the we over me mentality, which is something we preach here. And, and we always like to remind everybody, this is something that can be taught pretty young, right? A, a lot of people don't seem to realize that you can teach it's more than just saying, hey, you got to work together, right? Coaches can can implement that type of strategy and that type of mentality into their youth hockey teams of how important team play is. Um, and, and I just wrote that note here. Team play can be taught. So my question to you is because at the pro level, um, and this is another misunderstanding, it's a, it, it's a job. I, I think sometimes people forget it's, it's fun. We play a children's game, but it is a job. Absolutely. And, and, and some NHL coaches take the, uh, it, it, probably correctly take the approach of, it's not my job to teach you the game. It is your job to perform at this level. So I'm curious if, if with, you know, you've been around for every coach they've had, if, if you've seen things that you've loved about coaches in that team building realm or, or processes of coaches uh, within the organization that you thought, wow, that's really great. And that person found success. Uh, I have. And, you know, I'll tell you, it, it mean it means something when management uh, hires a coach for a particular reason. What we've done here with our team in Philly is, you know, we changed management, total management. 
you know, it's from from the chairman chairman on down. Everybody is different in the last two years, including the coach. So once a mandate is out there, is why where you're headed with it, you know, you're honest with the fans, which uh, the guys have been, and we're not going to rebuild and we're not going to retool. You know, uh, it it helps and it helps the coach in what he has to do. So there's a little bit of teaching there now at this level. Mm -hmm. Some teach more than others. Some coaches are hired to coach a team that's ready. Some coaches are hired to coach a team that is learning. So, and, and early in the season now, you know, you've got all these kids. They went through the system. The guys that were in Lehigh went through the system with Lappy, and he teaches the same system there they're teaching here. Has right. to. Otherwise, they're going to really be terrible. They'll be passing and there'll be nobody there. So, you know, that that all has to work together. And uh, some coaches are ready, uh, some coaches teach, and some coaches uh, don't, and they're not around for long. You know, when I think of, of coaches, I think there's really two types of coaches. There's the Kevin Costner coach, who's the same coach in every movie he's in, right? But he does it really, really well. And that goes to that point you were saying that if a team's in a certain position, that might be the guy, that might be the role. But there's also chameleon coaches, right? Coaches that can adapt to certain situations. And one of the big changes I've seen, as you just alluded to, is just the, the mental side of the athlete has changed a lot, especially over the last 10 years, where mental health, mental fitness, these are these are factors now that coaches have to take into account. And, and the best ones do. Yeah, the, the best ones make room for that and understand that that's, that's a change. And the, the point I'm making is that it doesn't matter if you are well-tenured or a newer coach, you have to constantly be evolving as a coach to in order to be effective. Uh, that's true. And, uh, you know, coaches uh, learn just as players learn, right. as announcers learn, as managers learn. You know, you can get burned by another manager uh, and easy. It happens easy. Uh, some are better than others. Some are going to be patient. Some are going to, you know, pull a trigger on something. Uh, if an individual is in a case where they've got to win or they're gone, mm. the tendency is to go for a lot of uh, people, uh, a lot of players that might be good for a year and not go down the road and stick around. What they're doing here, if I can take us to here, if it's okay to do that, Absolutely. is these guys are being patient with players while they learn. And while the players learn and uh, uh, get better at things and get used to line mates, because the players are going to have line mates changing pretty much you know you see the third fourth line now start games uh with delorie and you know those three guys that's the best group we have right now right and uh, you know the other guys uh, uh they have good games bad games and they're they're switching some players out and trying to figure out what the fit is but um you know nobody wants to play against that fourth line because they're going to hit you right. and um you know it's uh uh, it's interesting to see that. And I think the fans really like that idea. What little they have seen them together. Right. Two games. Right. Lou, what's funny is I think you just summed up youth hockey in a lot of ways it, it, from an NHL level patience while they learn. <laughs> it's something that sometimes we don't see a lot at the younger levels. We we see that. No, we have to win now, but you've really just described that patience while we learn people move around. You got to find the right fits. You have that one sturdy line that can maybe uh, you can turn to in a time of need, but um, I, I'm saying that because I'm trying to equate the NHL level to the youth level a little bit, that there are still similarities that, you know, we, we made, we made the statement here on a show one time, uh, kind of as a joke, but it's true that we, we made the statement that every level beneath the NHL is a development league. And then we said, and the NHL is kind of a development league. And when you really think about it, because you never stop learning, right. In terms of just the development of players, it happens at all levels. I think you're right. I think uh, you can you can break it into uh, you know what do we have 32 teams now, the 32 yeah, teams, 31, yeah. whatever. Not there 32. are groups. Gotta, I mean, there are <laughs> ones that are going to be good, and they're always going to be in the game and always going to be at the top level. Right. There are ones in the middle that have a shot at moving upwards to get in playoffs. I mean, it's all about playoffs. Right. What's that says? Coach said playoffs, playoffs, playoffs. Yeah, playoffs. So you know, and then there are guys that are just hoping that they're going to put on a good club together with what they're, what they're doing and make them learn to move into the next level. So, right. you know, there are, there are levels of, of teams that are going to be good and not good. Right. And uh, you don't want to be in the bottom level. Yeah. And it, it never stops. That's, that's the continuing evolution. Teams move never. up, teams move down. 
Um, I want to know, we're recording this in October, a, a time filled with anticipation right now where we're living. But in my opinion, this is the greatest sports month of the year. Because uh, if you're fortunate, all four or five, or all of your pro teams may be playing, which is which is uh, an amazing thing. So uh, Philadelphia fans have been coming up a lot lately in the media as the greatest home field advantage in sports. Now, this isn't going to be a Flyers or Philadelphia question. I just had to say that. But this is my question. How in tune are you and the athletes with the support of the fans? And how does that play in the team culture? Uh, I think it plays really strong uh, depending on how, how the game is going. I think mm. the fans can help the players. I think when, uh, when you have uh, 15,000 people there, the players realize that they're empty seats. Mm. And, you know, we have to realize as, as stewards of the game that as the players get better and as the record gets better, more fans are going to be at the game. No question about it. Uh, so when you, know, you look to put 19,600 people in there, you got to be putting out a good product. And I think that uh, teams strive to make their product better. And when right. they make their product better, they're going to get more support from fans and they're going to key into the support. I mean, think about, you know, the loudest game ever in, in the Wells Fargo Center was probably the first game we had there, which was, uh, I think it was World Cup of Hockey. I mean, when Canada played U.S., mm -hmm. I believe it was U.S. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you had guys playing for both teams and our team was good. And we had players both places. Rivaling that would have been the playoffs in 2010 or 11 mm -hmm. when Booch made that save at the very end of the game yeah. uh, against uh, the best shootout player, period, in the league and did the little dance, which he never does very much. But, you know, you think about it and say, well, Booch was a hell of a goalie, and he sure was. He's had a lot of good things. And now we're lucky to have him there. Uh, but, I mean, that was loud that day. And yeah. the J.J. Daniel shot. Uh, I guess that was uh, was the Wells Fargo. I don't know. You know, things go by and years go by, and <laughs> right. I've been around so long. I'm not really sure sometimes. You know. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember that series, Mike? No. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I put it, behind, I put it behind me, but I think I think it's uh, no. That's so, Lou. I had a really question because you know you, when you bring up just the the fans and and the rink and the atmosphere. I mean, do you? Do you feed off that? I mean, do, do, does your energy, I mean, are, are you trying to be even keeled? Or is your energy feeding off that as well? Well, uh, I I try to be a professional. Right. I try not to to yell very much. I try not to be like um, some of the teams. I won't name any teams, but there are, there are teams that are directed to do things differently and have shows, having a show. Uh, I think our players are our show. And, um, you know, the, I guess the one thing that is a little bit over the top is the pico power play which has its own life i mean it really does yeah we well, all know that it's own life so uh yeah. you know with that i try to try to bring that home and uh when our power play is going good it's great and when we're over five it's uh <laughs> not yeah. so good near the end there <laughs> yeah and and uh, mike you might not know this but there was a, a year or two there they didn't do pico power play and it was very weird for all of the fans because that's just how we've known the power play uh, for those outside of Philadelphia, Pico is our power company here, and they've they've sponsored the the power play for many many years. Um, and and Lou, to your credit, you have always been very professional. Um, in in my time watching the team, I've heard small inflections in your voice during good times. You know, you kind of you, you make those calls a little bit more like goal sure. calls sometimes, but you sure. have all it, which is great. You have always been uh, professional, and I think that the fact you have been there since 1967 says a lot about your professionalism. Um, well, you know, you go through uh, 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 times at the beginning there where they're not so hot, and then you go through great times. You win two Stanley Cups. I was announcing mm -hmm. for both of those, rode in two parades, you know, took yeah. the cup to work. I mean, it was <laughs> it was cool. And, right. um, you know, and then you don't do well for a little while because, uh, you know, players move around and, and uh, things happen. And then, you you know, you, you get into a situation where uh, you hope the team gets better. Right. which is where we are now, everything that can happen, but naturally big goals are going to sound better. I mean, yeah, it's just absolutely big goals, you know, when the crowd's going crazy, it, you got to get a little bit of, uh, of a hype in there. Yeah. But, um, you know, I yeah, try. Well, I, I'll say, look, I, I'll say this, I'm just thinking this, there's very, very, very few constants with a team. Uh, I was going to say the logo, but that's not true for every team, but the, the, with, with, with the Flyers logo, you, there's ice that they play on. There's not much else that you can say has been around the team. The 
the entire time. Uh, That's a good point. Which is which is an amazing thing. Um, I wanted to get to this too. We didn't say this in the open. I did say all the different games that you've announced. But in addition to all of that hockey, you also serve as the public address announcer uh, for countless Mites on Ice games. Huh, um, yeah. And we have a lot of parents that listen to this show. Uh, my kids have participated and will continue to participate in Mites on Ice. How important is Mites on Ice? And and do you have a favorite story? Uh, maybe not the one where, you know, Gritty abducted a kid and took him <laughs> off into the yeah, yeah. trap or somewhere. <laughs> I saw that. I do remember that. I do. We all remember <laughs> that. Yeah. Gritty's great. Yeah. yeah. Gritty, Gritty is sometimes out of control. Do I have a favorite one? No, I don't really. Uh, I I because I've, I've done them where they, they bring the kids in and they can barely skate. Right. And I've done them where, you know, one guy <laughs> is the whole game, <laughs> right? you know? scores yeah. three free goals and i've done them where the, the teams are great and it's like a one to nothing game and they're all skating like hell which is the best that's the best best one and when a goalie makes a big save you know kick kick save or something like that right or when a goalie is just not really the goalie but they need a guy so they put him in there and he doesn't know what he's doing anyway you know he's just playing on on the ice at the the wells fargo center but uh mites are great mites are great and um uh they uh they fill the time that's for sure. Uh, and uh, the antics on the ice that, uh, that go on with the games and things of that nature. Uh, they're all a product of uh, the environment in, in the 2000s, 2020s. Uh, games happen. You fill, fill the intermissions. You fill everything with something. Right. It's a show. <clears throat> so uh, that's really important. How how long do those mites on ice? It's so short, and I don't think people realize it. Seven minutes or something. Or uh, yeah. it starts. Uh, well, they run it. They run seventeen. Sometimes they run eighteen for intermission when uh, we're on national. And um, you know, we tell them at the beginning, and uh, you know, I always say we're going to play down to with a fourteen thirty mark. Right. Just right so. Right. Everybody knows they should be off. And then sometimes they don't go off and they have to move them away. And Gritty has to take them, escort them somewhere to his lair. Off. Yeah. Who yeah. knows where, <laughs> you know. And uh, yeah. most such the thing is when, when the, the teams are good, you know, Gritty will grab a stick and he's he's a heck of an athlete and skater. And, right. you know, he can shoot. He can play. So uh, he'll maybe take a couple shots in the goalie when the play's down the other end. And, yeah. you know, it's yeah, good, it, good fun. It, it, it's a beautiful thing. And again, it, it's only a couple minutes, a few minutes, but to those kids, it means so much. I mean, every one of them remembers that moment and it really might solidify um, their place in the game. All right, Lou, last question for me. I, I see we're coming up on time here. Um, everyone that's a fan of the team knows your voice. You know, I was thinking prior to this episode, I can hear you in my head when I think about the team. It's like ingrained in my head. It, it, it's It's an honor very few get just like playing the game. It's very so, kind of you. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean that. You know, you, you joked about the Pico Plow power play before, but I, I can hear your voice when I think of the team. I mean, it, it it's they, they go together, they go hand to hand. So, kind of a, a a softball question, but I have to ask it. You know, what does it mean to you to have endeared yourself to a city and to have a legacy like that with a team? Because again, very few people have that. Well. Uh... All kind words. You know, I'm, I'm a Southwest Philly kid who uh, was a rink rat up at the arena, which was uh, Eastern Hockey League. Uh, and um, because a classmate from school, his uncle was a goal judge, who later sat next to me as a timekeeper for the Flyers. Wow. And we used to go up there and we'd take broken sticks and play street hockey behind the school and a brand new street that was all surfaced and, you know, take chalk and make goals and try and figure out how to how to put tape on uh, shoe, uh, shoe shine boxes, you know, with the shoe stuff in it, make it look like a puck. And uh, we had a lot of fun. And I, you know, it's just an opportunity. I got an opportunity to do it. And I've tried to, you know, do the best I can with it. I'm still a guy from Southwest Philly, mm. you know, who grew up in hockey. And uh, that's it. I mean, it's no different. It just happens that I talk a lot when there's a game on. And it's really no difference. But uh, from the standpoint of, uh, of a legacy. I'm proud of it. Uh, you know, hockey is all around me. Uh, uh, um, I do a lot of stuff with it. Um, I have a lot of pieces of, uh, uh, memorabilia and a few sticks and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, I met some great people, uh, and, uh, amongst them, you know, Gordy, Gordy Howe and Bobby Orr and those guys, uh, and, and all our guys too, you know, you talk about Clarky, uh, and, um, Johnny DeClaire and Billy Barber, who was always 
number two, and he shouldn't have been. With any team, he'd have been the number one guy for sure. everything. He's a great player. Killed penalties, did everything. But, you know, it's a, the, the fact is that I was a part of it, and uh, I guess a lot of people would like to be in my shoes. And I got to remember that and just try to do the best job I can. Well, you do a great job. And again, I don't think someone sits in that seat as long as you if they're not doing a great job. I, I, I might even dare to say the best job, <laughs> but I'm I'm biased, but I believe that. And, and I'll say to you that uh, just echoing your thoughts that you, you're, you're stating again, the connections you get to make with people, even though you're not on the ice, you're in you're in the game, you're involved in the game and the, the people that you meet along the way. You know, there's the rub, right? That's really the gift. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Two Stanley Cups is nice. I hope I get to see one one day. But the gift is the people that you get to meet. You know, you got fathers that I've known who bring their kids to visit me. And, you know, we put the headset on them and take a picture and all that. And and that's one of the neat things about being able to do it, you know, because yeah. they moved me from the penalty box to the to a different section because of COVID. And uh, we've never gone back to the box. So, right. Yeah. So I I can be walked up to. <laughs> yeah. Well, like hey, we'll, we'll make people. a we'll make a little uh, a campaign here to bring Lou back to where he belongs. Right. That's uh, what it won't happen. <laughs> Some, somebody at the NHL <laughs> says they're going to stay wherever they are. It's not going to be in the box, and uh, right. that's fine. Uh, right. I'm over it now. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm not. No. Go. <laughs> yeah. Am I getting anything before I close this out, brother? No, no. I think just another example. We talk all the time, Lou, about, you know, the kids, uh, you know, when they aspire to be in the game of hockey, that there's so many options for them. Right. And you're you're a living proof of that. Like you don't have to be a centerman. You don't have to be a GM. You don't have to be a coach. You could you could. There's so many aspects of the game you can be involved in. And uh, you've made a career out of it. And and obviously you love what you're doing. And, and it sounds like the fans love having you. Um, but again, it's just another you know, another way for, for players to be in the game and stay in the game, uh, you know, and around hockey. I know my little guy, and we were laughing, he had a, he had a, uh, he had a videotape our, my 16 year olds game because we didn't have live bar in the rink. So he was doing it on the iPad and he was doing the play by play the whole time. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it wasn't what, you know, for, for, he, he did okay for a nine year old, but I think, you know, it was just funny hearing the inflection in his voice and, and he's just mimicking and mirroring, you know, the people he hears, you know, on, sure. on, uh, on his station. So it's really just, just another, just another reason for anybody that's listening. You know, there's so many different aspects of the game that you can be involved in. And it's, and it's really cool uh, to see you, you know, do this for so long and, and so well, um, you know, it should be, it should be really inspiring for a lot of the kids that listen. Well, it's again, you know, you guys are both very kind to me. I just get, I just go to the game and, and do it. And, uh, uh, try hard to, you know, make the pronunciations right and do these kinds of things <laughs> yeah. and, you know, go from there. But there are, you you know, there are a lot of things happen in hockey and a lot of people that are, were hockey players are now in management of our building. Uh, yeah. A lot of people who are hockey players are now our mascot. <laughs> Gritty, <laughs> Gritty can play. Like I said, he's good. Yeah. And um, he's got a personality that's unbelievable. I mean, unrivaled <laughs> and he can do everything, you know, hit a fit, hit, hit half court shot in uh uh basketball you know at uh the palestra i mean he's done things like that i saw him during an alumni fantasy camp first time i met him you know he walked in to the uh social event we had a uh um axe throwing lanes two of them there and he walked <laughs> in you know and gave, axe. <laughs> gave gritty an axe and he threw bingo target oh, right man. in the center i mean yeah. it's just that kind of a guy he just gets right. things done yeah it's yeah. awesome it, it, probably yeah. pretty close to signing him a few years ago but we'll, we'll take him as the mascot and uh lou i'll tell you what we've had carter hart on the show we've had Briere on the show now we had you on the show we're, we're going for a, a jonesy next we've, we've heard he's going to come on the show cannot thank you enough this has been fantastic uh, thanks for giving us some time today well i certainly appreciate being on the show and uh thanks to caitlin for contacting me and uh you know for you and mike uh, to to be the uh, on air guys, so uh, take care all of you and uh, let's go Flyers. Yes, absolutely. And I will note here that this is the eve of the season opener. He gave us some time here today. I want to remind everybody to lose book. If these walls could talk, has a lot more in depth stories than we were able to get to today. Make sure you grab that. 
uh, uh, whether you're a fan or not, to be honest with you. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, Lou Nolan on us with Our Kids Play Hockey today. That's going to do it for this episode. Remember, if you want to hear all our episodes, you know where to find them. It's wherever podcasts can be heard. Make sure you follow us, though, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. I'm sorry, X, whatever they are now. You know where to find us. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Have a great day, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.